The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Generation Life Limited, ABN 68092 843902, AFSL 225 408, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Listening to Strategies to Facilitate Intergenerational Wealth Transfers, a special five part mini series from the Ensemble Podcast. Over five episodes, we talk to authors, practitioners, product providers, and a lawyer to reveal what works and what doesn't for advisors and their clients when it comes to retiring and leaving a legacy. As the pioneer of Australia's first truly flexible investment bond, Generation Life has been at the forefront of providing innovative, tax-effective investment solutions since 2004. As an innovation-led business, Generation Life constantly strives to enhance investment solutions to optimise after-tax investment performance for investors. As a leading specialist provider of tax-optimised investment and estate planning solutions, as well as investment-linked lifetime annuities, Generation Life works closely with financial advisors to secure the financial futures of many Australians and their families. Hello and welcome to this special XY Advisor podcast mini-series focused on retirement income and the related advice issues. I'm Vin Scully, veteran advisor and founder of LifeSherpa, Australia's most affordable financial advice service. 2022 marks 165 years since the Australian Mutual Providence Society offered the first pension savings plans and 30 years since the introduction of compulsory super. Now, total assets in superannuation total almost $3.5 trillion and benefit over 16 million Australians. 2022 also marks the introduction of the Retirement Income Covenant for super funds, but more of that later. The history of superannuation in Australia has been marked by almost constant change. Super was either an attractive tax shelter for the wealthy and self-employed or offered to a small proportion of the workforce, mostly the public service or white-collar private sector workers. By 1974, just under a third of the workforce benefited from employer-provided superannuation, and males received it at twice the rate of their female colleagues. Back then, life was simple. There was no tax on contributions, no tax on fund earnings, and only 3% tax on the resulting lump sum benefit. 1983 saw the introduction of a 30% tax on retirement benefits and the birth of rollover funds, which allowed this tax to be deferred indefinitely, or at least until death. Although readily avoided, this tax proved hugely unpopular and protests led to pre-1983 balances being grandfathered at the old rate. Older advisors will recognise this as the source of the old pre- and post-components, which created much complexity. By 1988, then-Treasurer Paul Keating cut this exit tax in half to 15% and levied a further 15% tax on contributions and fund earnings. Just five years later, Compulsory Super was born with 3% superannuation guarantee payments applying from July 1993, which lifted super coverage to 80% of the workforce and total super assets to $169 billion. Contributions at the time were made to a fund chosen by the employer or nominated in an industrial relations instrument such as an award. Members weren't given the choice of fund until 2004. Reasonable benefit limits were introduced in 1994, giving everyone a lump sum limit of $400,000 and a pension limit of $800,000. These and the related transitional reasonable benefit limits granted to existing members created a range of strategies for advisors. Looking eerily similar to the current Section 293 surcharge, a short-lived surcharge starting at 15% and later dropping to 12.5% was introduced in 1996 and abolished in 2005. The Costello budget of 2006 changed everything and greatly simplified the system. This created a series of immediate opportunities for advisors and taxpayers alike. These measures abolished RBLs, removed the requirement to draw benefits at 65, and eliminated tax and retirement benefits. This, in effect, replaced limits on benefits with limits on contributions. 2017 saw the introduction of the transfer balance cap to limit the tax concessions on pensions. I'll recap all of this to demonstrate that as advisors, change is ever-present. Some of it good, some of it bad, but all of it creating opportunities for us to add value to our clients and improve our businesses. Those who embrace it will thrive, those who don't will ultimately fail. And all of this brings us to today's topic, the Retirement Income Covenant. 
specifically what it is and why it matters to both consumers and their advisors. The measure of forces super funds, or more specifically the registrable superannuation entity or RSE, to formulate a retirement income strategy, publish a summary on their website by the 1st of July 2022. To help us understand what this means in practice, I'm joined in the studio by Ruth Stringer, a leading superannuation lawyer. Ruth is a partner at Mintra Ellison and a non-executive director at ASX-listed platform provider Hub24. She's previously worked at ASIC in the superannuation group and was general counsel at MLC shortly after NAB acquired it from Lendlease. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you, Vince. Nice to be here. Now, there's a lot of being talked about the retirement income covenant, which sounds very strange. And as of July this year, our super funds have had a whole bunch of new obligations added. Can you tell us a little about what the retirement income covenant is? Thanks, Vince. The a covenant is a very strange sort of a word, um, but essentially it's a promise which is in the legislation and it follows the pattern of many obligations that are in the CIS legislation that are that are expressed as a, as a, as a covenant. But if we leave that to one side, essentially um, what it requires is for the trustees to formulate and develop a strategy um, which is to do with developing retirement income or producing retirement income for members. And it follows, you know, similar covenants exist now for um, investments. So there's a covenant to have an investment strategy, covenant to have a, an insurance. Uh, so what's your about covenants? Are these promises to members? Yeah, essentially. It's it's um, effectively as if this was a clause written into the fund's deed. Um, and therefore, it means that it's enforceable, I suppose, by members if, if there were no covenant. Um, and it's also enforceable under the superannuation legislation as well that the trustee has to um, comply with the covenants and if, if, it, if it fails to do so, then there are pen- penalties attaching. And so this covenant to have a strategy to deal with retirement income, what do the super funds actually have to do on July 1 of this year? Well, on July 1, they had to have formulated a strategy and the strategy has to take account of a number of things. Predominantly, it's about maximising retirement income while um, also balancing that against the risks of of longevity risk, inflation risk, and various other prescribed matters. Um, And so the strategy is really putting pen to paper and justifying what it is that you believe ought to happen to produce a, a good, solid, reliable, stable retirement income. And not only that, you have to publish a summary of it on your website, so I think there's a real transparency angle here that's you know very useful because it's requiring trustees to I guess justify what they either do or don't have by way of retirement income products and what thought they've given to their own membership base what their needs might be how to meet those needs recognizing I guess really for the first time that the retirement phase the decumulation phase is very different from the the accumulation phase and really turning their minds to how to serve their members in in providing good retirement income uh, products. Because most of the publicity and media we see about super is about that accumulation stage. And, you know, I guess Compulsory Super 1993 is just coming up on its 30th anniversary. So if you were a a wet-eared graduate in 1993, you were still some way off retirement. Mm. So why do you think now? Well, it's a great question. Um, And I think, uh, you know, I've been practicing super since before 1993, actually. Um, And I think, you know, there was probably, uh, I I guess, a sense in which this was all very new. Um, I mean, I think the, the, uh, you know, the boomer generation and um, had probably felt that we have a a system of an old age pension uh, in Australia. And that, um, you know, if you owned your own home and you were going to get the pension, you know, she'll be right, (laughs) essentially. Um, But I guess having had the move into compulsory super, which is clearly designed to augment the age pension, which is really um, not a luxurious lifestyle from what I can gather, um, then there's, there's been a lot of focus on getting the account balances up. And so in the early days, you can imagine the balances were not terribly strong. But as the balances have been growing, I think that's the impetus to look at 
what is actually happening. And it's, it's a maturity thing, I think, of our system because, um, you know, we're, it's not until you have decent sized balances that you need to start thinking a little bit more um, strategically about how to how to use those to, to fund a, a retirement income that replaces your salary. And obviously longevity has increased in that time as well. So um, the life expectancy for retirees is just a much longer period and um, you're therefore running out of money toward the end of life is, becomes a bigger concern. So this is just a strategy. So there's no requirement for the super funds to go and develop new products at this point. Correct. E- is there a plan B or part B of this that will require them to? At this point, I mean, I think, you know, if we look at the genesis of how this came about, at an earlier point in time, the government was looking to be a little bit more um, uh, directional in mandating what was going to be called a comprehensive income product for retirement or a SIPA, bit of a mouthful. Yeah. Um, but the government's walked back from that more prescriptive approach and really is is looking at a light touch. And I guess because we've got the precedent of the strategy for um, investment strategy, which is a really important trustee function, the idea is, I think, designed to allow bespoke solutions and not to place any requirements, um, but really to to place the, the asset on the trustee, I suppose, to, to justify what they're doing, to look to the needs of their particular member base, because, you know, these could potentially be quite different depending on account balances or um, demographics, and so th- therefore to really um, take this further. But I think having said all of that, I think the reality is as as funds develop an initial strategy, as they gather data, as they think about what those needs look like and what we you know what the um, longevity risk might be, that they will they will start to look at product. I think product will inevitably come into the equation, yeah. and product development, you know, will be part of what they'll end up doing. So is this sort of subtle code that we really want you to get on and develop products in the sense that, you know, the um, the old requirement to consider that the investment strategy must consider um, insurance needs, for example, which was generally became a, you know, a part and parcel of a super fund that you almost couldn't have one without insurance. I think it is. I mean, I think it is a form of nudge. I mean, if you call that a nudge, and I think, you know, it, it, we we talked a bit before about the history to this, and the last time I saw any statistics on this, uh, something like ninety four percent of the retired population were in an account based pension, and you know, I think for most people, trying to manage an account based pension and work out how much can I safely withdraw and how much should I withdraw? What's the time horizon? How should I invest it? You know, that's a pretty vexing yeah. problem for people. And so I think to the extent product can be developed to to make life a bit easier for the retiree confronting that problem, you know, I think it's probably overdue. Yeah. I mean, certainly what's often referred to as longevity risk, or for old blokes like me, a longevity opportunity, because I'd like to live a, a long and purposeful life for many years in retirement, so longevity, the length of time your pension has to last, is probably a bigger risk than what the market's going to do tomorrow, mm. and yet with the demise of defined benefits, we actually haven't really seen anything more imaginative coming out of super funds than account-based pensions. That's right. Are you seeing trustees looking to develop well, those sort of products? I think that it's been very interesting because... If I look at the last 10 years, I've always had a lot of client trustees come to talk about these products, and very often I think they've been interested in doing it but didn't have the confidence um, because the competitive landscape was not such that others were doing it. And so there's only been very, very modest development to date. But I do think that the covenant is kind of a line in the sand, Mm -hmm. and um, not that there's products all launched on the 1st of July, but I think the the kind of cycle we're in now is a lot of a lot of funds have committed, you know, in writing in their strategies to at the you know, at least consider expanding their product range and developing products that more explicitly address longevity uh, risk. <laughs> and so it feels like there's now a, a momentum and a commitment. So I I do believe there will be more product development in that area. 
So one of the things that I, after being asked to do this, I went and actually tried to find these on quite a few super fun websites. It's generally not an easy task, but um, yeah, so most of them talk about longevity. Most talk about inflation, and of course, for anyone who wasn't around in the 70s and 80s, inflation right now is a bit of a novelty um, and potentially a very scary thing. And many seem to talk about advice or what tools can be provided to help people work this out themselves. So I guess the question is, that doesn't appear to be required by the act as I, as I read it. So it, advise, if you were to advise a trustee, a hypothetical trustee, obviously we don't want to talk about any real ones, mm-hmm. um, what would you be advise them to do around dealing with um, the any other risks, which is a bit like the sixth step in the safe harbour for best interest. Yeah. Do everything else you might think might be appropriate. <laughs> what are the sort of things that would spring to your mind in that space? Uh, well, I mean, you, 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 you've mentioned um, the longevity risk and the inflation risk, which are kind of explicit uh, call-outs, I suppose. Um, I mean, I think this is probably more a question for a financial person in terms of, you know, what risks there might be, um, you know, in, t- in terms of um, the member the member experience, you know, potentially. I guess you'd think about things like health risks. And mm. I-, I guess one of the difficulties in this area is if you were thinking about the risk of, for example, having to go into an aged care facility, you start to get into realms which are classically outside of superannuation yeah. and yet, very, very important to the members' financial well-being in retirement. And so I think it, it is a bit of an open question what that any other risks might mean. I think one thing I would just say is that because the covenant is so new and we're really in the information gathering phase, I know a number of funds are going to survey their members and ask the members what the members are concerned about. Um, and we'll also, I think, be looking at gathering a whole lot of data about you know, for example, the age pension and the cost of living and um, trying to bring all of that information together, I suppose, before maybe changing the product mix or the way that they engage with retired members. So I think there's work to be done in really uh, the the trustees will need to go out and look to what Mm -hmm. those risks might be and how they might be addressed within the construct of a fund. Yeah, I mean, all those issues about health aged care, um, dealing with kids and ageing parents at the same time, the so-called sandwich generation, mm. does make this a lot more complicated than it might have seemed in 1993 where mm. you know, we had, uh, as you say, most people relied on the age pension, um, the, uh, what do we call them, the four pillars being yes. the age pension, family home, the... Um Obviously, the super super and non super savings. savings. Mm-hmm. And uh, those other ones are becoming bigger and bigger you know, mm-hmm. with um, inflation in our home prices. If you look at the family balance sheet or the household balance sheets, the family home ranks right up there. It's still ahead of our super. Uh, for our younger members, their super tends to be bigger than their home savings, but. Um, as we head towards retirement, the big family home in Pimble um, is still worth more than most people's superannuation balance. Mm. And some of this seems to be working in a different direction or pulling in a different direction than you know, the recent changes about the transfer balance caps and all those things. So there seems to be a whole bunch of different things happening here which don't all seem to be pulling in the same direction. I think that's right. And I, I mean, it's well known, I think, that superannuation has has been a bit of a political football yeah. and getting a kind of really consistent position, particularly when you have the sole purpose test and, you know, different ways of interpreting that test and, um, you know, financial well-being and retirement, uh, in, and I'm speaking to the expert here, it is not just what you have in your super, it's it's the whole picture and, you know, health players into it and so it, 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 it's a little artificial taking the super yeah. uh, as a standalone. And, I mean, super also has the constraint currently that um, each individual has their account in super. It's not a mixed or a joint it's asset. It's not a household asset. No, it's not a household asset. So there, there's some constraints around super that, um, that mean it doesn't work seamlessly uh, in, in the mix there. But I think 
the idea of focusing on, I, I think to me it's a little bit like really just focusing the mind of the trustee on the fact that, well, what are we doing this for? It's not to sort of produce a really big number at 65 and then say, off you go. It's it's really the, the focus needs to be how am I going to assist um, in really providing retirement income or assisting the member to, to achieve that retirement income. And I guess coming back to the point about product, it, it's one of the reasons it's not prescriptive. One of the outworkings is to, to your point about um, generations. I mean, there's nothing in this that, outlo- that makes it illegal for a member to want to use their super to, to leave a bequest. Yeah. Um, that, that can still be accommodated. That's one of the many needs or wants of, of the member population. Um, but it's having options that uh, address other needs like the longevity risk and like the peace of mind of, you know, income that's, you know, immune from inflation risk and all the different permutations of um, member wants and needs that... that Although, interestingly, leaving a legacy is not one of the requirements. It's not intended to be one of the ones that (laughs) that the trustee should prioritise. So the trustee doesn't place a priority on that, but... Uh, but you know, if the members choose to have that as a as a you know a feature, then if you don't have it, they may go elsewhere. And of course, we have a system where the funds income or the trustees income is dependent on assets under it management. And obviously, the more the retirees spend the money, the less funds they're left with. Absolutely, classic conflict of interest. Um, now, you mentioned that you know at the point of retirement. There's a need for education, for knowledge, for advice, for understanding the options. Um, and m- many of the strategies, is that the word? Cop- um, yeah, strategies. Yep. Um, I saw did allude to the advice piece. Mm. Um, and that, I guess, goes to your point about the sole purpose test that. Um, there are limits on fund members' resources as a whole being used to provide advice mm. and bringing in what's happening right now on the quality advice review and yeah. the future of um, super fund advice. Um, have you got a view on what you think might might be happening? Or like- well, I think um, what's well, hard to know, I guess, politically, because obviously the quality of advice review is commissioned by a former government and uh, hasn't released its final paper, but the the interim paper was very, very interesting. Um, and a key theme of that paper is an expectation that super funds have historically kind of, I guess, stood back and said, you know, we'll manage the money and we'll, um, you know, trust look us. after you and trust us. But they've not been, typically not been coming forward in terms of wanting to get into the advice field, certainly not personal advice, although many of them have a relationship with an advisor. But Um, the thrust of the proposals to date are very much that the super funds are very well placed to give advice because they do hold a lot of data about the member and that there's there's an expectation in a sense that they will be more proactive in um, potentially approaching members and potentially offering guidance. I think it's interesting. I guess the, the, the way I look at it is historically, you know, more or less super funds have offered one retirement income product. So, I mean, there hasn't been advice required about which which type of pension should I get because oh, there's, been, one. there's only been one pension yeah. type. And typically, the investment options are the same as the ones mm. on the way through. So, um, you know, in a sense, that you could say that, you know, the, the advice need hasn't been um, forefront of the trustees' minds because I guess their interest is in the person simply seeing this as a continuation. It's all the same as when I was in accumulation right now I'm in pension phase, yippee, I get a tax exemption, isn't that great? And the government tells me how much to take uh, because the government prescribes the minimum. But when you think about that, that's quite an unsophisticated position to be in um, because the members are left, unless they do have an advisor, um, you know, potentially in a default that may not be the best outcome for them or may require, may result in them living very frugally because they're taking a minimum income when they could actually well afford to take a bit more. I mean, those minimum drawdowns are obviously designed to get you, if you last long enough, for it to disappear. Correct. Um, but obviously, the number of people who get to the the big drawdown levels is relatively small. Yes. We're talking about 
life expectancy of 88. Um, I think you get into the 90s before you have to start drawing down yes, various substantial amounts. Yeah. That it does leave retirees generally with significant balances yes. at death and a super fund that has no incentive to encourage you to spend more. That's right. Um, which I think is a big challenge that potentially that's an opportunity for advisors to help their retiree clients enjoy the fruits of their labour. Mm. Certainly we see retirees dying with often as big a balance as they started with, sometimes more, and um, not having enjoyed it whilst it was there. And on the other extreme, we see you know, late 50s people endangering their own retirement by buying homes for their kids or putting their kids through university. Mm. Um, so, I, I mean, that is a challenge that requires significant amounts of advice. And Jenny you would question mm. whether the super fund is the right place to to get that, including most of the audience I question, podcast. Well, <laughs> I, I question whether the super funds will have the appetite for that because when you think about it, they're already quite a broad church uh, in offering a range of investment options and potentially a range of products. Uh, you know, they're there to 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 suit the needs of a of a large cohort of members, not to get into the tailoring side of things. So I, um, you know, it's a nice idea perhaps that they will suddenly leap into giving advice, but I'm I'm not entirely sure that that will actually be how it, how it plays out. Um, but just to, something you said uh, made me think of a point we were discussing yeah. before, which is when you think of just even the basic concept of income. You know, up until retirement, people will think of income being simply the investment earnings. And it's a huge mind shift to think, well, now I'm in retirement. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people just think retirement income. Well, that's the income on my capital. Yeah. So the reluctance to actually convert the capital into a cash flow. I mean, I sometimes wonder if we even need a different different terminology because income just has this kind of very deeply held um concept that it's the fruit of the tree and it's not yeah. the tree itself. And so that, that's a huge um, change in thought, pro- thought pattern and thought processes. I mean, it is a really difficult transition for the human brain to deal with, that we go through 40 years of spending bad, saving good, mm. and now we have to say to consumers, actually, spending good, just not too much, Yes, saving Maybe it's time you stop thinking about that. Yes. And, um, but we still need to be able to give them comfort that the under- undertaker's so. that you'll actually be able to cash the undertaker's check uh, <laughs> when you actually get there. Um, and you know what markets will do, what taxes will happen in the future, how long I'm going to live, um, is my spouse going to live longer than I am? How do I deal with all these uncertainties mm. and spend with comfort? So the advisors would have become as much a therapist and psychologist as they do a Absolutely. advisor. Absolutely, so, and it's so important to treat the whole Yeah. Now, one point you, you raised about the sole purpose test and how that flows into who pays for this advice. Clearly, we know from practice that retirees are the people who are most willing to pay for advice, that two-thirds of all financial planning clients are over 55 and that shouldn't be surprising because, A, they've got lots more money and it's becoming an immediate problem of that course. I've got to deal with this right yeah. now. And super funds have been limited in their ability to use members' money to subsidise or pay for those services. Would the same thing apply to the super fund investing in digital tools to deliver that advice? I think the enhancing their website? <laughs> um, it, it oughtn't to. I mean, the the... The overriding thing is the digital tools need to be focused on the super fund. So if the tools are around, you know, what will my balance be at this age and, and playing around with different uh, returns and, and, and the like. I think, you know, if you had a specific tool that said, you know, should I have a fixed or variable mortgage, then that probably is outside. So as so long as it's in the general territory of retirement um, savings and, and the super fund, you know, where it fits into the retirement savings picture, that should be... Fine, and I, and I think that is the area that is more likely to to interest the super funds. The, the idea of kind of guidance or putting out cameos or 
uh, what you what you might call sort of um, investing investor liter- literacy and try to improve standards of literacy and education. So I think super funds would be well placed to provide that kind of guidance. Um, and you know, I think that uh, you know, I suppose just on the quality of advice review, if we can divert from that for a moment, I, I, I'm, we, we've just made a submission on that. And one of the things we think is, uh, to me, I, I'm not an advisor, so I don't know how this works, but to me it feels very artificial for the advisor to go in and say, well, it costs X amount of money to advise, you know, on your super fund, and then we'll, we'll charge this other little bit of about, you know, what's going on outside super. But um, disappointingly, the review, I guess, proposed that that distinction be maintained, that it's only the part that relates to the super fund that should be able to be paid for yeah. out of the account. We've put forward a different idea, which is that really there should be some kind of modest release amount that is, um, I'm not going to say what amount it is, someone can figure that out, but but that should be just released for advice. That's like uh, a, a condition of release yeah. as well as being for a hardship to be to pay for. Pay for the financial advice because that, you know, then the advice can be, uh, you know, can, can look at the whole picture and can look at the spouse, for example, rather than this sort of hmm. constraint that for it to come out of the fund, you know, it must be limited to that member because it's coming out of that member's account. And secondly, that it can only be limited to advice in relation to the super. I just think that's, it's creating a ridiculous cost for someone to have to define that boundary and then for the trustee to supervise it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting, interesting point. I'm not sure I've given that too much thought, but certainly, um, you know, we do a lot of work around budgeting and debt elimination, all of which can't be paid for from super. Yeah. And um, then the bits around retirement savings and potentially stuff around using the first time super saver scheme. Yes. So you end up with this quite artificial split, which I guess we've just got so used to dealing with that I haven't actually given it mm-hmm. that level of thought. But that is actually quite an interesting uh, idea. Well, again, you get into this question, some people will say, oh, but it's eroding savings, etc. But I think if you cap the amount um, and you know, made it, you know, something that over time, you know, you could have certain opportunities to do that. It just seems I'm all for trying to make things simpler. Yeah. And I guess the, these issues all arise when, as a society, we mandate that a 20-year-old, you're not allowed to spend, you can only spend 91% or 89% of your income now. Um, you have to set aside 10 and a half for retirement, that every time we start interfering in people's spending habits, we need to be very careful about the consequences yeah. intended or otherwise that arise from that. Absolutely. And so that I first time... We saw that super- with the COVID mm. releases, you know. Uh, that the first time super saver is a potentially overcomplicated way of addressing some of those issues for younger members and that mm. COVID releases were, mm. were helpful. Um, and maybe we just need to think about it over the longer term well, if you're forcing people to set aside portion of their income, you know, we have a duty to mm. make sure that they are actually better off both now and in retirement. Well, I do think that, that I mean, I probably, um, you know, I guess when you look at it internationally, we could have a system where we said, well, instead of the tax concessions on super, we'll increase the social security. Yeah. Um but because we're forcing people to save privately, um, you know, not everyone's going to have the skills and the tools to to um, be able to manage that. So I think it doesn't seem to be a big leap in my mind to accept that people will need assistance to to navigate. You know, what is a, a, a system which has a lot of choice and can, you know gives the individual a lot of freedom. Um, but but you know they need help to 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 um, to navigate it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add to the retirement income that we haven't covered off? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I think personally having been involved in, you know, it's been a bit of a, uh, a a very long project to really shine a light on retirement incomes, I feel very pleased that we do have the covenant. Uh-huh. I think it's a really great first start and I think it will be very, very interesting to see the strategies, particularly I think the day one strategies are all kind of, you know, it's like a race. They've all kind of got off the blocks. Yes. 
But as they mature and as they gather their data and do make their inquiries, I do think they will mature and it'll be very interesting. So I do feel like it's quite a tipping point and I think um, I'm hopeful it will lead to new products that will really assist assist members to, to get the most out of retirement. Well, certainly the ones that I saw in my brief review before setting out on this exercise did seem to sort of fairly slavishly copy the words of the um, the covenant and most looked like work in progress to me. Absolutely. And I think that's why really, A, it's a start uh, and B, you know, I guess it's probably a reflection that the fact that a lot of them are quite basic to my mind is actually proof of concept. It's yeah. why we need it because it shows in my mind, again, that without the covenant, it, the, 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 you know, there probably is not the focus on this part of the part of the problem, if you like, that 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 there ought to have been. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that with us, Ruth. Thank you, Vince. Uh, it's been great having you. Thank you very much. That was Ruth Stringer, superannuation partner at Minter Ellison. As she said, the retirement income covenant on its own won't necessarily lead to greater innovation in the available retirement income products, but it will help focus the minds of the bigger super funds on the retirement income phase and away from the accumulation phase as their membership ages. The account-based pension will over time cease to be the dominant vehicle for spending superannuation savings and will be supplemented by innovative lifetime income streams. This will create a huge opportunity for advisors as a wave of super fund members reach retirement over the next decade with larger balances than previous generations. They also have higher expectations for what retirement means and of course will live longer than their older equivalents. All of this is great news for advisors. Over the next four episodes, we'll delve into these opportunities and the related challenges for advisors. We'll chat to authors who have written extensively on the new retirement paradigm. A spoiler alert, this is as much about psychology as it is about the technicalities of products, regulations, tax and social security. We'll also talk to practicing advisors to learn what they're doing. And of course, we'll chat to our sponsor, GenLife, about the innovative things they're doing in the income space with investment bonds and market-linked annuities. I've greatly enjoyed putting this series together, and I hope you enjoyed listening just as much. So until next time, bye for now.